This is the fourth video in a series about the GCSE chemistry topic of chemical analysis. In this video, we're going to look at both flame tests and flame emission spectroscopy. These topics are only in GCSE chemistry or triple science exams. So if you're taking GCSE combined science, you don't need to know this information. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how to complete a flame test to identify five different cations, including what the colors of the flames are for those cations. You should also be able to describe flame emission spectroscopy and how we could read a spectrum and compare the use of instrumental and human methods. The AQA specification says that many cations produce characteristic colours when burned. But what does this actually mean? Well, firstly, what do we mean by a cation? A cation, of course, is a positive ion, and these are formed when metal atoms lose electrons. When we say that they produce a characteristic colour, that means that if I take any compound that contains a particular cation and I burn it, I will see the same coloured flame. If I burn a compound that contains lithium ions, then I see a flame that is crimson, this dark pinky red. If, on the other hand, the compound contains sodium ions, it will burn with a yellow flame. And if it contains copper ions, then I see a green flame. The reasons that we see these colours are a little bit beyond the GCSE specification, but it's pretty interesting stuff. As you learned at the start of GCSE chemistry, electrons exist in certain energy levels or shells. When we draw atoms, we assume that the electrons are as close to the nucleus as possible, because this is the position in which they are most stable, and we call this their ground state. This is where we would expect to find them. When electrons absorb energy, for instance because the atom that they're part of is being heated, it's actually possible for them to become excited, and they move to a higher energy level. In other words, they get slightly further away from the nucleus. Eventually, they will return to their ground state because that is where they're most stable. But in doing so, they have to release that energy that they've absorbed. And they release that energy not as heat, but as light. The wavelength of the light released corresponds to the color of the light seen. So in other words, wavelengths of between about 400 and 700 nanometers. There are five cations for which you need to know the characteristic flame colors. As we've already seen in this video, lithium compounds burn with a crimson flame, sodium compounds burn with a yellow flame, and copper compounds burn with a sort of turquoisey bluey green flame. You also need to know that potassium compounds burn with a pale lilac flame, and calcium compounds burn with an orange red or brick red flame. The first step in carrying out a flame test is to clean a nichrome wire. We use this nickel and chromium alloy because it has a very high melting point and because it doesn't produce a flame colour of its own. We use a Bunsen burner to remove any dust and then place the wire into a small beaker of hydrochloric acid. The acid will react with any leftover metals from a previous test, removing them. So we could be confident that when we put the new compound on the wire, the flame colour that we're seeing is just from that compound. It's not from anything left over from a previous test. The hydrochloric acid will also moisten the wire and that's going to allow us to easily pick up a solid salt. Although you can also do this test for solutions. You just tend not to get as bright a colour. So here I've got a small amount of copper compound. You can see it there in my spotting tile. So I put the wet wire into that copper compound, that copper sulphate, and then put this into the edge of the clear part of a Bunsen burner roaring flame. And you can see that greeny blue flame there. Before I can do another test, I need to return it to the hydrochloric acid to make sure that I have removed all of that leftover copper compound. Now that the wire is clean, I can repeat the same test, only this time using a lithium compound. And again, I see that crimson, dark pinky red flame. One of the biggest problems with flame tests is that if you have more than one cation present, then the colours will obscure each other. Say, for instance, I have a mixture of lithium and potassium, the pale purple lilac colour of the potassium flame would get completely blocked out by that really vibrant crimson colour. And so I'd be able to identify that lithium was present, but not potassium. This is one of the problems with this method. To get around this, we can instead employ an instrumental technique called flame emission spectroscopy. As we know, instrumental techniques have three big advantages. They're accurate, which means the answer they give is likely to be very close to the true value. They're rapid or very quick, and they're sensitive, so they can detect very small amounts of a substance. 
In flame emission spectroscopy, the sample is put into a flame and then the light that comes out is passed through a spectroscope. And this produces an output called a line spectrum. The position of the lines on that line spectrum correspond to the different wavelengths of light. So blue light with a sort of a wavelength of about 700 nanometers would be at completely the opposite end of the spectrum to red light with a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. We can compare the positions of these lines to say whether or not a particular element was present in a sample or not. The thickness of the lines corresponds to how bright the light was, and that corresponds to how much of the substance was present. So if we're thinking about a solution, then this would be the concentration of the iron in that solution. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope that you found that a useful introduction to these chemical analysis topics. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry videos coming soon.